Good evening, everyone. Um, I declare the meeting open at 6 p.m. and welcome you all to our council meeting this evening. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We have no apologies this evening, so I'll move straight to public question time and receiving of public statements. So welcome to you, members of the public gallery this evening. Um, this is an opportunity for you to um, come to the microphone and speak to Council on any items on the agenda this evening. If you do wish to do so, we just ask that you state your name, the suburb in which you live, and we do ask that you speak for just up to three minutes. And the CEO does time, so there's no set order. It's just whoever would wish to um, approach the microphone first. So. Together, we can deal with them together unless anyone wishes to highlight that they have um, an issue with any of the leaves sought this evening. So we have, um, bear with me for one minute. Sorry, they do have separate number allocations, so I think I do need to deal with them separately. So 4.1 is Councillor Jonathan Hallett requesting a leave of absence from the 13th of February to the 22nd of February, inclusive due to personal commitments. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I declare that carried. Item 4.2 is Susan, Councillor Susan Gontoszewski requesting a leave of absence from the 29th of June to the 4th of September 2020 due to personal commitments. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Woden. All those in favour? Declare it carried. We have a request from Councillor Don Loden. I assume that's you, Councillor Dan Loden. No, just not you? <laughs> point, just to, sorry, Mayor Cole, just to, uh, well, it can come up later as well, but a point of order or clarification. Uh, item 12.5, Councillor Hallett is seeking to represent Council on behalf of Council. Can he be on an approved leave of absence and representing Council at the same time? That's a very good question. I'll refer to, um, to the CEO or Manager of Governance on that. Uh, through, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, Councillor Hallett uh, is travelling to Melbourne uh, for work commitments, which is non-council business, but then uh, as part of uh, interstate travel, there's two days on which you'll be uh, representing council during that conference. So it depends on whether council uh, is keen to split the uh, request for leave of absence while Councillor Hallett is interstate to separate out the two days when he's at the conference. Deal with it at 12.5. Okay. All right. So we'll move on. So we have a request from Councillor Dan Loden for the 26th of February to the 6th of March uh, 2020 for personal commitments. Moved Councillor Castle, seconded Councillor Smith. All those in favour? I declare that carried. So the next item is receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. We have nil this evening. So we'll move to confirmation of minutes, item six. The first set of minutes is for the ordinary meeting on the 10th of December 2019. Could I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Fatakis, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. And we have the meetings of the special council meeting on the 28th of January 2020. I have a mover and seconder. Moved Councillor Fatakis, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. Um, announcements by the presiding member is the next item. I have just a few um, things to mention quickly. Um, I did mention this at the last meeting, which was a council briefing, but given this is formal announcements, I would like to formally welcome Virginia Miltrup to the position of Director of Community and Business. Um, it's great to have you on board. Um, we welcome Virginia from the city of Kalamunda, and Virginia has um, got some really great experience, not just in local government, but also in the corporate sector, and has some great skills that really traverse that very wide chasm of community and business. So we're very pleased to have you on board. Um, I'd also like to talk about the fact that we have a very exciting event happening in the city of Vincent. We have Perth Festival coming to Beaufort Street for the first ever lit crawl in Perth. This is 
quite exciting for us in Vincent to welcome the, the Perth Festival, which is an internationally recognised festival, one of the best um, we have here. And on the 20th of February, a Thursday night, um, we'll have 18 free events happening down Beaufort Street. It's an opportunity to experience literature, slam poetry, um, authors' readings. Apparently there's even some fight club style tips from girls doing boxing. It's a bit of a mixed bag of everything. And it's happening in our local businesses along the strip, places like Lawley's, Mount Lawley Art Framers, Mary Street Bakery, Dainty Dowager, Beaufort Street Books and Planet Books. So this is a really big coup for the City of Vincent in particular for Beaufort Street that we're really looking to activate and get some exciting events down there. So please come along on Thursday the 20th of February to that fantastic event. Also just wanted to say um, thank you to Northbridge Common for the Lunar Lantern um, Lunar New Year Lantern Festival which was held on William Street last night. Um, the street was closed to cars. We had children chalking up the roads and chasing bubbles and um, lion dances and cultural dance happening. It was a really lovely event and just wanted to say thank you to Northbridge Common for arranging that. And at that event, the City of Vincent did take the opportunity to talk to youth um, to help inform our youth action plan and managed to talk to about 75 young people and get them to um, be excited about doing a survey to ask them about what they think we should be offering in the City of Vincent and what their thoughts are on a range of issues so that we have a plan that really responds to um, the needs, priorities and ambitions of young people in the City of Vincent. So that um, work will continue and we'll be seeing our team out and about consulting with young people over the next um, couple of months and we hope to have a plan um, formulated and ready for consultation by the end of this financial year. So that's it from me on the public statements. So what, what I will do now is um, go to the CEO for declarations of interest. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, I've received one disclosure of a financial interest from Councillor Toppleberg in relation to item 12.4, the lease of 246 Vincent Street. The uh, extent of the interest being that representatives of Councillor Toppleberg's company have engaged with the city in relation to potential upgrade works for the property at 246 Vincent Street. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now go around the room to see if council members wish to pull forward items for debate this evening that haven't already been um, talked to by members of the public gallery or I don't think we have any absolute majority decisions this evening. So. Banks Reserve Active Zone. Yes, we do have that one. So that will automatically be called forward and also the item on which um, Councillor Toppleberg has a financial interest, although that's already been raised by a member of the public gallery. Um, Councillor Hallett. Councillor Castle. Councillor Wallace. Councillor Fatakis. 9.5, 9. 9 Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Loden. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, 9.6 and 11.6, please. Councillor Smith. Councillor Gondoszewski. Okay. Um, given you wanted to talk, discuss leave relevant to the attendance of the conference, I'll bring forward 12.5. <laughs> Just a question for council members, is there, would anyone object to moving the confidential item on block this evening as well, 17.1? Or do you wish to discuss that? 
No. You happy to move 12.5 on block? Okay, we'll, we'll put that back into on block and also 17.1. So the CEO will just list through those items. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I will now read out the uh, agenda items uh, that have been identified or proposed to be moved on block by Council, which includes items 9.2, item 9.4, item 11.1, item 11.2, item 11.3, item 11.4, item 11.5, item 11.7, Item 12.1, item 12.2, item 12.3, item 12.5, and confidential item 17.1. Thank you, CEO. Could I please have a mover and seconder for the on block items? Move Councillor Fataka, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I declare the on block items carried. Um, so just for the purposes of our visitors from the Men's Shed, lovely to see you here today, Roy and Linton. Thank you for coming along. Um, the item on the Vincent Men's Shed's licence for storage containers has been approved on block, so we won't be debating that this evening and has been supported. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Love to see happy customers. <laughs> Okay, so the way in which we deal with the um, business of council is that we first go to the items that were raised by members of the public gallery in the order that they were raised. So the first item that was raised this evening was item 9.3, numbers 452 to 460 William Street, Perth, proposed alterations and additions to shop. And this is unauthorised existing development. Can I please have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Gontoshevsky, seconded. Councillor Fatakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I think this is a challenging one because I think the, this, the building in question is in a prominent position on a major street at an entrance to the Northridge Town Centre. Um, however, I'm uh, very conscious that um, of the unique nature of the business, um, that there are other requirements in relation to safety that um, need to be or guess of crime prevention that need to be adhered to. And whilst there are different ways that those requirements could be met, um, I still feel that um, I'm not ready at this point in time to, um, I guess, end the conversation on that. Um, I note the referral to the Heritage Council and their comments on this matter. Um, and um, uh, I also note that there is an alternative on the table, um, two alternatives on the table. Um, and so I, um, in this instance, I, I can appreciate that um, we want to stand firm on heritage. I don't think that the role of shutters in question are um, a positive addition to the building. Um, however, I believe that um, there are measures that the city can put in place to both um, certainly put a position in relation to the um, the roller shutters in question, um, but uh, while still noting that um, uh, this is an existing business, I, I appreciate that you know that there have been conversations that have happened over a period of time, and that um, that the city's position is probably not necessarily a surprise. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm I'm not sure that I'm uh, ready to um, uh, call it yet, um, so I won't be supporting the um, recommendation before us. I would, but I would be supportive of a very short-term um, approach to um, allowing things to continue. Um, and then hopefully that is something that where alternative um, and uh, storage arrangements can be found or a um, you know change to the um, model of the business um, could be a, a, a considered in relation to the ongoing of, um, storage of that equipment at the premises. So. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Look, I fully un I understand and fully support the intent of the firearms um, regulations and the Act, um, and the need to secure these premises. Like Councillor Gondoshevsky said, there it's a very unique business, um, but really, I suppose, a high risk business with dealing with firearm and ammunition. Okay, and I understand the significance of this application um, to the business owner uh, with retaining their licence to trade, and it's probably been a major reason why. Um, I've really given um, this matter quite considerable um, support during um, the week. Um, look, I'm of the mind to support the officer's recommendation, but I'll be really interested to um, hear my fellow colleagues um, with their comments on the two year. But really, I disagree with the applicant's um, contention that the roller shutters improve the aesthetics of the building. Um, and I am concerned that the approval will set uh, a dangerous uh, precedence, two years um, approval or not. So um, I will need to actually be convinced that that is not the case. Um, I accept the Heritage Council's um, assessment that there's minimal damage to the building, um, but our considerations here tonight um, with respect to the Heritage Council are far-reaching. Um, this is a planning matter and there's a lot of other issues that uh, we need to consider and can't um, ignore, particularly with the inconsistency with our policies and our heritage management policy um, that the officer has uh, referred to in the report. Um, and as uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky um, referred to, um, this is a significant her heritage building. Um, it's on a corner site. It's um, one of the significant entry points, um, not to our city, but to a major part of our city where we've um, just uh, spent many years waiting for um, a two-way on the traffic and a big reason for that um, was really to recognise that this part of Northbridge um, is becoming increasingly more vibrant and to see the building shut up basically um, like a prison, no interaction with the, with the street and even the times that I've been past there, what concerns me is in the past before the shutters went up was really the lack of attention that was given to the presentation of the building as well. It really looked, uh, didn't look like it was a business in action, it looked like it was actually um, under, um, I suppose, uh, almost like squatters had taken over um, because of the condition of the front of the building. Um, but so there's the detrimental appearance and the impact on the amenity, um, so the appearance of the shutters. Um, and I've no doubt that there are other options available and I really wish that there had been some dialogue with the city staff prior to the, the straightforward in, um, implementation of these shutters to really look at what the alternatives uh, would be. So I'd be interested to actually hear comments from uh, my council colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Fatakis. Councillors? Councillor Hallett. Just a, a question. Um, in admin's comments about some of the proposed alternatives, it, there's a comment around um, the importance of passive surveillance from the shop front into public spaces. Just wondering if you could comment on um, how that applies to, uh, a, as a criticism of the alternative recommendations, given that the shutters won't be down during business hours. And so there'll be no passive surveillance after hours because no one would be in the shops, presumably. Through you, Mayor Cole, there is a requirement in the um, city's uh, planning framework for there to be maintained interaction and um, uh, with the street, between the use and the street. Uh, so while the, the use would be in operation, the business would be open, um, there would be some level of um, interaction maintained um, through the doorway and uh, potentially through the, the shop front itself. So uh, I suppose if uh, the proposal was to be supported and the roller shutters installed, there would be significant periods of time, including uh, on the uh, second half of the, the Saturday during the day as well as on the Sundays where that wouldn't be provided for. Does that respond to your question? I mean, I think, I think you're referring to passive surveillance perhaps into the shop, but just the, the way this is worded, it's about passive surveillance from the shop front into the public space. So um, if the shop's closed, I imagine there wouldn't be any surveillance um, happening whether the shutters are there or not. So, um, yeah, just uh, I guess broadly, I'm similar to Councillor Gontoshevsky. I'm not 
quite as anti the um, shutters as um, some others um, from comments and Councillor Fatakis. Um, I think given the the appearance of the outside of the um, shop, I quite like the shutters in comparison. But um, nonetheless, I, I recognise that um, it, there is some inconsistency with our policies, but I think it's also a, it is a unique premises and um, I think the advice from the Heritage Council um, makes our position slightly more um, complex. Councillors, um, look, I have some comments. Um, I think that this is an unusual situation in that this is the only firearms premises in the city of Vincent. So that is, that is, um, this is not a sort of retail outlet of, of the normal variety that we, that we usually deal with here. Um, and I do think that our position has become more difficult because of the fact that the police has had a very hands-on role in um, taking um, the Yossies through the application of these shutters. And I understand the police actually attended the installation of the shutters and um, that the Heritage Council has adopted a position that in their words they state that, well cited in the report states that the roller shutters are not permanent and won't damage the fabric of the building, that the building, that this shop does have unique security requirements and therefore they have supported um, the shutters being in place whilst the firearm shop continues. Um, I do think that the current window presentation is not ideal um, in terms of the, the grills and the just the sort of presentation of the windows. And I know that this issue has been sold on today tonight as bureaucracy gone mad, but I also do really think this is a difficult decision because having attended the Lunar Lantern Festival last, year, last night and being out on William Street, which is a beautiful street, really lovely canopy. As Councillor Fataka said, it's just been converted to two-way. You've got Wines of Wild next door that has alfresco tables and chairs right out on the pavement next to this store. It is absolutely not ideal deal to have roller shutters on a on a on a corner facing building as you really enter the heart of William Street in the city of Vincent and I do feel concerned that when other shops or businesses see roller shutters on uh, windows which is something that we have a policy around in the city of Vincent that that may encourage others to see that as a security measure that they would like to take up um, but I am a pragmatic person and I think that when you've had the police attend and install and the Heritage Council say this is, this is fine from their perspective, I think that, um, that to say um, to not allow this to happen for a short period of time um, or to the ceasing of the business, I think that would be where my comfort level lies. I do think that this has to be a short term measure because I think that it does have an impact on the streetscape. But on the basis of, of the safety factor, that this is a very unique situation being our only firearm shop and the fact that it has been through both the police and the Heritage Council, it does create a difficult position for this council and so I won't be supporting the um, recommendation before us but would um, be seeking an alternate that would have a short term approval in place. Councillors? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the motion carried. Okay, the roller shutters must be gone. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, could I just have a show of hands of who's here for 9.1? Um, that's, that's the uh, Cleaver Street development. Okay, so everyone, in, mostly uh, the majority of people here in the public gallery here for 9.1. It was raised as a third item, but um, I will go to that item given that we have people here waiting on that item. So 9.1 is number 64 Cleaver Street, West Perth, proposed 11 multiple dwellings. Can I please have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a challenging uh, uh, proposal that's come forward. Um, partially because of the orientation of the block being uh, sort of facing east-west. You get these challenges around um, overshadowing and so forth that we're seeing and we're having a lot of discussion around. Um, and also that it's, it's an area that's zoned, <coughs> zoned R80. So it is, as, uh, as has been pointed out, 
um, allowed to be three storeys high. Um, I fully appreciate that people feel that that is too high, but that is the reality of what, um, what is permissible in this space. Um, and the question that we have to answer is whether or not the departures from what is permissible are, or what is an acceptable outcome are, are fair or reasonable in this context. A um, number of issues have been raised by the community on this. Um, the, the parking was one issue that was raised. This is actually compliant in that regard, so that's not a valid basis for refusing it. Overshadowing. Um, we have seen um, information provided around how the ad overshadowing plays out. If um, this was built as a three-storey building to the maximum limit of the heights that it can be permitted to build and with the appropriate setbacks, this would actually result in greater overshadowing of the property to, to the south. Um, I, I feel like despite it having four storeys and being higher at the front, it does show sympathy to that the, their southern neighbours there. The overshadowing is occurring on as part of the buildings that do not, uh, are not the, the open air spaces for those people. Overshadowing is not an issue to the north because the sun does not, will not shine uh, in a way that will then cast a shadow to the north. Um, so that, that's um, not really a consideration in this context. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my space here. The, um, where are we? The setbacks do show that sympathy as well, I think, too, to, to, the, to the south. And I mean, particularly the, the most challenged people in this space are the people to the south. Um, and, but the interfaces are managed in that context. The, uh, to the south, there are narrow openings provided uh, in that direction to the, uh, and obscured glass to the north as well. Um, there has been questions raised about the financial impacts of that. I've, fully recognise that, that, is, that is, there is a financial impact for neighbours in this context, but that's not a valid basis by which we consider, can consider this application either. Um, and what else was there? And there were some concerns around amenity. There is a, a fair amount of uh, tree planting that's occurred along the boundaries of this development as well to, to offset those issues. There is planting at the front of the development as well. Um, so when I look at that and I consider that uh, whether this is an acceptable outcome, I've landed on the position that this is acceptable. I recognise there has been some discussions with the neighbours as well um, which on Monday, which I was not able to attend. Um, so I am interested in any insights that have come from those discussions as well, and I will listen to the debate. But um, at this point, my, my view is that this uh, re application should be supported. Thank you. Councillor Gondrzewski. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, I think Dan, uh, Councillor Loden, has certainly set out um, the issues in play. Um, one of the things that I wanted to focus on for me was that this is an application that's um, clearly been on a journey from first submission through one, two, three, four, five referrals to DRP and a referral to a pa uh, the, one of the DRP panel members, um, and that there has been. Sorry, um, Councillor Gondrzewski, just for the. Um observers in the room, the design... Oh, um, sorry, the oh, design review panel. Yeah, so um, the um, group of um, uh, that provides um, design, architectural and landscape architectural advice to the city um, that assist in formulating um, the city's position. Um, this, uh, the plans as they have evolved have been reviewed by this group five times and then there was a subsequent referral to a panel member in January 2020 um, and there has been changes made to the plans um, and that there has been some improvement. Um, I note that there are a number of conditions within the um, recommendation um, that relate to the outstanding areas of concern that were raised upon last review. Um, and um, so I, I feel somewhat, um, I'm, I, I feel that there is a benefit to that process um, and that this uh, development has um, improved. Um, I can absolutely accept the concerns of the neighbours and surrounding residents, but um, in my view, this development at this stage is supportable. Again, I um, was working and was unable to attend meetings on Monday, so yes, happy to listen to the debate, but um, I don't have an alternative on the table for this one. Councillors, Councillor Hallett. Just some questions. Um, they're slightly disparate, so I might ask them one at a time. Um, 
through you, Mayor Cole, to the um, manager. Are there any existing policy settings that could prevent the demolition of the existing 1920s development that's on the site? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, there is no um, prohibition against demolishing the existing dwelling on site. Um, what are the maximum number of tenancies that would be permissible for development on this lot size? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it's not so much about the number of tenancies, but it's probably more so about the plot ratio. So that means that there is one, then? Through you, Mayor Cole, just to follow on, um, I guess the plot ratio is ultimately the total amount of floor area that could be accommodated on site. Uh, under the R codes, volume two, the acceptable outcome is a plot ratio of one. Um, and it is proposed to be 1.03, so that is a departure of approximately 28 square metres in excess of uh, what's set out in the acceptable outcomes in R codes Volume 2. Um, has admin conducted any traffic surveys in this precinct recently, and if so, can you tell us anything about the parking usage currently? Through you, Michael, I'll take that question. Uh, not to my knowledge, I'd have to uh, check and provide that information at another occasion. And just the last one, if this development was deemed to be refused by council and appealed at SAT, what would be the status of the conditions um, in the admin's report recommendation? Through you, Mayor Cole, if I understand that question correctly, um, those conditions that have been recommended by administration, should this application be approved, would have zero relevance in terms of council's decision because ultimately it will be a, um, an alternate for a refusal. Um, that would be the, the weight of those recommended conditions. Concluded there. Yes, okay. Councillors? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Colt. A uh, few comments. Um, I think principally, and it doesn't directly relate to the application, so I'll be brief on it, but I think I made the comment on site yesterday. I think uh, we collectively, as community and as a council, should probably uh, take a really good look at our uh, suite of planning policies in terms of not being able to protect the home uh, that exists on the site uh, in that built form, uh, and at the same time not providing a uh, fair opportunity for owners of the site to be able to redevelop whilst retaining the home. The current planning framework doesn't uh, allow for that, so I won't dwell on it, but the, a home of that size and of that nature uh, in that area uh, is irreplaceable, and the fact that it's uh, able to be uh, demolished without any uh, DA or that it's to be replaced with the built form that's proposed uh, I think is a terribly sad outcome for the community. I think we all... Uh, collectively have a responsibility to ensure that going forward that we look uh, at that more fine grain uh, element of what we uh, define as heritage and character and how we manage it. I think it's a really good example where the owner uh, is completely entitled to pursue the application they're pursuing and it large, largely falls within uh, the requirements of, of the scheme. I'll talk to that in a moment, but if you take a step back from that and that process they've gone down as individuals, if you just walk down the street and look at it and ask as I did yesterday, I asked myself the question, how is it that we can't protect this? I think it's a pretty poor outcome and a poor reflection on uh, our MHI and where it sits when it, well, how it was first developed and what we've done with it uh, in the 15-odd years since, uh, since that time. So that's just, a, I suppose, a, a general comment. Um, for me, the key issue with this proposal uh, is the overshadowing, and the overshadowing... Uh, if you look at the way that the R codes define overshadowing, in a, and I'm talking particularly about the southern lot, I know there is some uh, expression of concern from the neighbours to the north, and there are some neighbours that will have uh, a significant impact uh, compared to what might otherwise be compliant, and some neighbours that will have almost none, and that, that is, a, that is a, a reality of being in a, a uh, relatively tall uh, development that is afforded uh, uh, views and space that, and has been for some 50, 60 uh, odd years and for a site that is able to be de redeveloped for the south, that impact uh, uh, is going to affect people differently. But if you look to the south, um, if you look at 
the, the nature of each of those uh, outdoor living spaces. Some of them are completely enclosed. Some, um, the point was made yesterday that the floor plan of most of the properties at 60 Cleaver Street that they actually uh, orient their living to the south uh, to the south side, so the upper floors, the master bedroom is uh, with the balcony, and for most of them is looking towards the city, the driveways to the south. Um, but if you look at and if you look at the way that the R codes look at overshadowing, even in the previous iteration, uh, for group dwellings they look at the whole site, they don't look at the individual sites. And so the issues that you have here, I would say, where the bulk of the impact is uh, largely that overshadowing already exists from Cleaver Court. Uh, the specific property at the front of 60, um, the, the very front dwelling at uh, the front of 60 Cleaver Street, is going to have an enormous impact. Uh, their outdoor living space is uh, well ventilated, it's open, it's a large expanse, uh, and they, uh, for the first floor, there is the driveway, but there's uh, proposed to be landscape screening pretty much uh, up to the boundary, which effectively from their point of view in terms of access to light is effectively solid and the next two storeys is only set back 1.5 metres from their boundary. So that it will have a significant impact on that property to the south. Um, when you look at the process the applicant has been through, um, I made the point to the consultant when he contacted us the other day that the, the DRP uh, does not approve plans, they don't provide uh, it's not, not their role to do so, but certainly uh, the, the impact of overshadowing the design, that interface with the street was looked at uh, in, in a broad sense and I, uh, I think that, that the applicant, uh, where they've come to and the changes that they have made has largely responded to what's been asked of them both by the city's officers and by the design review panel. Um, so uh, the impact of the fourth story uh, which is the, the significant departure in terms of height, uh, does have some impact on a couple of the, the front dwellings at uh, 66 Cleaver, Cleaver Court. Uh, the presentation to the street, I'm not going to talk to that because that's, uh, that's a subjective matter. I think, uh, for me, the, the, the key issue that, uh, that I struggle with is that overshadowing at that front uh, of that uh, outdoor living space for that front dwelling at number 60, but if you look at the R codes, if you look at the potential t to defend a potential refusal or even to require that to be changed uh, as a design change, there are very, very, other than forcing them to go back to three metres uh, for the, for the um, second and third storey, which would have a negligible uh, positive impact to the south. Uh, there's very, very little to, to hang our hat on, so um, I will listen to the debate, but I do uh, I am conscious that there will be some significant impacts on some of those dwellings to the south. Um, in particular, uh, and do recognise, as has been mentioned both last week and this week, that uh, the presentation to the street compared to what the existing dwelling provides does uh, pose some streetscape uh, concerns for the surrounding neighbourhood. Councillors. OK, I'll just make a few comments because a lot has been covered by my colleagues. Um, I just want to go back to the site that we're dealing with here. It is an R80 zoned site. Um, it, it does have an east-west orientation and it is next to Cleaver Court, which almost wholly overshadows it as a lot. So there are some, there are some site um, issues at work here that um, does lead to it having impacts on its neighbours in the same way that its neighbour has an impact on it because of the orientation of the lot and um, the R codes aren't sufficiently sophisticated that we can take lot orientation into consideration in terms of actual density and the way in which it can be built, built to. And I think it was an interesting question about the plot ratio and that that is really a measure of density and that when we're talking about the density of this build, it is um, 0 0.3. 1.03, so it's 0 0.03 more than what is permitted, which I think you said, um, Acting Director, was 28 square metres. So in terms of its density, it's not really well well over um, what is, um, what is um, permissible. And um, I just want to go to some of the issues around parking. I know that is a concern of residents, and I think that when you're densifying, that's, that's a valid concern to have. Um, the, the parking requirements have been met, and that is set by state planning policy, one parking bay per unit plus the two visitors' bays. But the way in which the city has responded to this is that we don't provide um, residential parking permits for people who buy apartments and knowingly move into apartment living 
um, the idea being that you are you are effectively moving into a low car um, living situation and it, and we do make it clear that parking permits are not available to to those residents so there, there will, won't be street parking for residents unless they just wish to park for two hours which would be pretty difficult um, in terms of views I do understand that there is an impact of views for some at Cleaver Court at the lower levels and that is unfortunately an issue that we cannot consider as part of our planning determination I have looked at the fourth story and I've also looked at the the, um, the, the building line overall and because the fourth story is a little higher and we looked at the fact that um, this is a, to the top of a concealed roof as opposed to a pitched roof which would be able to go to that height but would be pitched but I think that when you look at that in the context of the, the um, second block being lower than permitted then you look at it as an overall um, impact and the overshadowing diagrams that we have been provided with in which um, the, the acting director added to the council agenda so we hope that everyone's had an opportunity to see those demonstrate that what would be um, compliant overshadowing versus um, what is proposed would actually have a slightly um, greater impact but that the overshadowing um, the areas of concern such as the front um, unit at number 60 will be overshadowed regardless whether this is compliant or not because that overshadowing is um, right up against the boundary line there. Um, also just in relation to the side setbacks I have looked at those and I understand that is a concern and I think that the way in which I've considered the overshadowing the, um, the landscaping between Cleaver Court and the proposed development and the fact that the side setback to Cleaver Court presents as um, quite a, it's not an interactive facade, there's no balconies, there are highlight windows etc. So in terms of um, any impacts from a landscaping privacy perspective I think that those have been dealt with. Um, and just in relation to finally um, the design, um, whilst I think that in some ways the front corner does present still as, as a sort of quite a white block and there could be further work there. This has been to our design review panel five times and, um, and they have really, I think that previous iterations were not satisfactory and they have got to a point where the design review panel plus the conditions that have been put in place by our um, planning team um, have, have actually got to a point where there's a level of comfort about, about that design. So. Um, it was very valuable to meet with the residents and I do thank you all for your time and for coming out and um, it probably won't please you to hear me say that I do think that this is approvable because I think that the variations, um, are, that there actually could be more impact if this was a fully compliant build and I think overall um, that does need to be taken into consideration so I um, do support the application. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Oh no, sorry, all those against? We have um, Councillor Wallace voting against. So I declare it carried. Thank you everyone for coming in this evening. The next item on the agenda is item 12.4 which is the lease of 246 Vincent Street leadable to Minister for Works, Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries. This is an amendment to incentive. Councillor Toppelberg has a financial interest and is leaving the meeting. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item please? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Fatakis. Yes. I've named you Councillor Fatakis. Are you wishing to not be the seconder? Um, I'm not too sure whether Councillor Gondoshevsky prefers to speak. I just put my hand up just for seem to be. I'm very happy for Councillor Fatakis okay. to second. If I need to speak, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did have a, a question um, through the Mayor. Um, I did have some email exchange earlier today just around. Um, how the costs work. So the previous iteration showed a $1 million payment um, in July 2020, followed by 600000 in 2021. Um, and we've now shifted that to 
um, 558333 in July 2020, 533333 in July 2021 and 533333 in July 2022. Um, so, but in that process we are on net uh, spending an extra 25, we have to pay an extra $25,000 but the benefit of that is that it defers that cost for us. And the question in my mind is, is that worth it? Um, could we have, would it be easier to borrow that money, pay the interest on that rather than paying the extra $25,000? There's a point in time when that additional cost would not be worth it. If they said it was an extra $100,000, I hazard a guess we would say, no, let's go to a bank and we'll get the money and borrow it. Um, the question in my mind is, where is that, that threshold? Um, I did some basic um, NPV calculations because I'm an engineer and I like playing with Excel and couldn't help myself. Um, and to my math, the discount rate that makes this an even deal for us is around about 2.6%. I think admin had a slightly different number, which is probably more accurate. Um, so, but then at 2.6%, that is more than what we could borrow money, uh, borrow it for, I think. So if it was, if we could borrow the money at 2%, it's semantics, I know, um, but we would be $5,000 better off, roughly. So I just wanted to get some comment from the director on that, if you could, please. Uh, through you, Merkel, I might mm -hmm. just comment. The uh, decision on the funding, uh, how to fund that incentive, uh, will be up to council when it sets uh, the budget this year and um, the long-term financial plan of the next 10 years. Uh, so. Um, just to note it wouldn't be a decision that needs to be made today, how that's funded. Uh, our the indicative thinking or current thinking of administration was to uh, access the asset sustainability reserve uh, for that incentive payment uh, and then to pay uh, that back over 10 years into that reserve as opposed to borrowing. Uh, that is a, as a decision council can make um, when, when it uh, adopts the budget in June. Um, but just to note that, yes, there is a marginal difference, but that would depend on interest rates at the time, and uh, that's not something we could predict, uh, but we do consider it would be marginal, and our preference at this stage would be to use the asset sustainability reserve rather than to uh, go into new borrowings. So how much is currently in the asset sustainability res reserve? I'm... Um, uh, without looking at it, I think it is about three million, but um, uh, I I could confirm that um, with with you, councillor, a bit later. Sure. So I mean, I guess it's more than the one point six million that we need for the purposes of this. So whether we took a million out and then and six hundred out, or did it in three stages, if that is the decision that council makes down the track, the the net flow of money is well, slightly higher in the case that we're now considering. Um, so I, I guess the question I'm trying to get answered is, is maybe I'll flip it around. At what point, if the, they had come back and said, we want this money plus X dollars, would we say, actually, you know what? We prefer it the other way around. We would have the million dollar payment and then the $600,000 payment. What's, what's the switch point if we are, if we've effectively got the money there, we just changing the scheduling of that coming. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the slightly general answer to that would be it would depend on interest rates at the time uh, and Council is in a position where it can choose uh, to access that asset sustainability reserve which um, certainly exceeds the proposed incentive payment for the next um, three years. And so to my understanding our reserves earn about 2%. So I, I guess in my head I would thinking that would be the threshold that we would use because it does seem to be have been relatively consistent historically um, and we are talking a relatively short time frame um, difference of a year or two um, so do does do we have a basis that we use or I guess is, is it done on a case-by-case -case basis then uh, through you, Mayor Cole, it, it, it definitely is done on a case-by-case -case basis and this is quite a unique situation uh, for Council being um, 
essentially the only large commercial lease where there are commercial terms like this that need to uh, be considered. So this is unique and, and one-off, so it will be up to Council to um, decide um, based on this particular instance what its preferred funding mechanism would be. I'll, I'll let it be. <laughs> um, I'm not going to propose an alternative recommendation that we go back to where we were for the sake of in my math is five grand, but I think it's an important thing that we need to be thinking about if we are looking at our long-term financial plan and when we schedule our activities and all that sort of stuff, we need to take into account the time value of money, um, inflation and all that sort of stuff, and it would be good if we had some benchmarks or something that we would use or a basis that we would use so we can help to inform those decisions as well. Um, so I do support the, um, the officer recommendation, um, but I think we should think about this stuff a bit further in the future as well. Councillor Fatakis. I'll just be quick. Um, I'm supportive um, of the recommendation. Um, the 1.625 uh, million, um, well, when it got presented to us, the 1.6 million, I think, came as a bit of a bit of a shock. Um, a lot of uh, reporting back questions um, asked to to get a lot more understanding of that. Um, you know, further to that, uh, the work that the officers and the mayor did to really look at the breaking that down to um, three, I suppose, a little bit more palatable um, amounts. Um, the additional twenty-five thousand. Yeah, well, I take uh, what um, Councillor Loden um, is uh, is saying. I think it's it's really coming down to a lot of um, a lot of that is just the, the what ifs. Um, the market is tough. It continues to be tough, and I think this is a this is a sign that commercial ne negotiations at the best of times um, are difficult. Um, but when you are restricted as to the tenant that can occupy um, the property to being just this one tenant, um, I think then that puts us in a um, doesn't put us in a in a great advantage when it comes to negotiating as you would do in the wider field. And I know that there has been comments previously uh, levelled against uh, the council of why we're not why we're taking the approach that we have with this. Um, a lot of that is because uh, we're restricted to to dealing with this tenant and solely with uh, with this tenant. So I'm happy to support um, the recommendation. Also like to acknowledge the work that's been done to to get us to this stage um, and not accept the first, for council not to accept the first recommendation that was uh, provided to us last year and just require um, a little bit more work to, to get to a result that was a lot, uh, a lot more palatable, certainly for myself. Um, councillors, I'll just go to the CEO because it's pointed out there was a question from um, Mr Meyer from the Public Gallery this evening about Regulation 10 in this circumstance. So would you like... Maluka, uh, sorry, the Manager of Governance would like to address that. Through you, Mayor Cole, I think uh, it was referring to Regulation 10 of the Local Government Functions and General Regulations, so that talks about the requirement for a business plan to be prepared for a major land transaction. A business plan was prepared when this lease was originally entered into in 2004, and so that satisfied the requirements for that because this variation relates to the same lease term. So um, there's no requirement for the city to provide further public notice or prepare a business plan. Thank you, Manager. Um, councillors, does anyone wish to speak to this? Um, I think there has been also some discussion about the fact that this incentive is not automatically going to be used towards a fit out, but functions as a re reduction in rent payable and will go to the Department of Finance Consolidated Fund. Um, I think that Council has always accepted that this is in effect a rent reduction but um, just in terms of the fact that we were looking at having a um, requiring a schedule of works and that we were looking at having a building that would be fitted out and I guess that would add some value to the property um, what sort of guarantee do we have that the the department will still look to upgrade through a fit out uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the fit out is getting close to end of life, and uh, during the course of or in between Council's considerations of uh, this item, I did meet with the uh, Department of Finance and the uh, General Manager in charge of uh, 
the state government's property portfolio. Uh, my and I previously met with the Director General of the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries. Uh, there uh, will be a fit out during the course of this lease, um, but it won't be, uh, it's not imminent, and I don't expect it to happen in the next uh, 12 months or even potentially in the next two years. That'll be subject of a separate business case, a separate funding um, uh, proposal. Uh, within the state government and then separate consultation with us and we could advise um, council uh, when we're aware of that uh, fit out um, taking place and um, it would certainly um, occur I would have thought over the next um, four to five years as part of the uh, state government's um, renewal of their uh, office accommodation. And further CEO any comment on where we started with this negotiation where we have ended up? Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, uh, as I mentioned previously, in response to Councillor Loden's um, question on the funding arrangement for the incentive payment, uh, this has been, uh, and it still is, uh, a unique uh, proposition for Council uh, from the initiation of uh, the Council's decision to uh, bid um, to provide the office accommodation for what was in the Department of Sport and Rec uh, on a Crown Land Reserve um, with a very specific condition, planning condition put, in, put on by the Planning Commission that it could only be used for the administration of sport and recreation in Western Australia. Uh, we were keen and we essentially went through a commercial uh, lease negotiation and to, um, uh, we employed a commercial lease a negotiator on our behalf uh, to make sure that the terms um, reflected um, the current market conditions, which Councillor Fatakis referred to as well. Uh, my main comment would be that uh, the proposal in front of Council um, provides uh, financial security and financial stability uh, for what is our uh, most important commercial revenue source uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, we do get, to, it does maintain uh, the asset and we do have a uh, tier one tenant and being the state government which does provide a uh, strategic uh, investment by the state government in office accommodation uh, to support the Leadable Town Centre and we think that's something which we can uh, build on and grow uh, as the Leadable Town Centre um, becomes more attractive uh, for A-grade office accommodation which uh, is illustrated right now by the construction currently taking place across the road from this building on Vincent Street of uh, the ABN development and uh, we think this is something we can build on in the future. Thank you CEO. Just to follow up, um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay to support this. Um, we have asked a lot of questions along the way and we have come quite far on these negotiations. Um, I do think that uh, it is good to commit um, the Department of um, Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries to this to this building and it would be great to pursue opportunities to see more of the agency locate at this site if that's um, if that could be um, a, a lobbying opportunity for us because um, that could then lead to the fit out and having more people in the building and in in the Leadable Town Centre which would be really good for our local economy here in Leadable so um, it has um, been quite a process to get to this point. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. So um, they were the three items that were um, discussed by members of the public gallery this evening. So we'll now go back to those items that we have not yet dealt with and move through them sequentially. So the next item is 9.5, amendment number four to local planning policy number 7.5.15, character retention areas and heritage areas to include guidelines for the Boulevard, Kalgoorlie Street, Maclot Street and Buxton Street. Can I have a mover and seconder moved? Councillor Fatakas, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
I've loved seeing the process of really getting um, getting these character pr uh, precincts up and running. Um, and I think since uh, the state government's um, planning and development regulation changes in 2015 that um, really removed um, the council's ability to acquire planning approval for, for demolitions, I think that really started a process that um, still many of the community aren't aware that those um, really those powers of council have been uh, removed and you see the distress of many of our city's residents when they um, realise that um, neighbouring properties are no longer given the option of um, commenting or being even afforded the respect of being advised when um, a neighbouring home is going to be demolished and particularly in our streets where we know people move to this area because they love um, the beautiful sort of like character streetscapes. It's, it's more than the design of our houses. We actually see that with all of the work um, that community along with council have done to really activate um, our suburban streets and right through to the street verge policy so we can get kids out playing on the verges, creating nice sort of uh, green garden areas. All of that I think speaks to the sort of streets that um, our community want to see. Uh, certainly from what the comment that came earlier in, um, our community do not want to see rows of double garages in their streets and I think they voice that really quite strongly. Um, and you know, and I think I, what I really do enjoy about being on this council is that see the strong support that our council had, which recognised um, that as being significant to our community, and really took that um, right through to to SAT level. And um, and like the community, I was really happy to see that we had we had a bit of a win in that regard. But. I think what it has highlighted is where we need to, to really look at uh, doing some work. Um, while we realise that we've got state policies we have to speak to, it does put um, our unique areas um, at risk. Um, and I think in this, um, with the loss of so many character homes in our cities, um, our community feeling helpless to really stop it. Um, I think these character retention areas are one way that residents and property um, owners have to highlight um, the importance of their unique streetscapes um, and really I think also highlight um, what the unique aspects and really clarify um, so it assists us when we have got planning um, applications ahead of us um, which really speak to what um, what exactly our community believe uh, are important to them. Um, so I want to say thank you to all the community um, that who many attend have attended previously who've contributed um, to the whole character retention policy. Um, hopefully we see this uh, this grow, grow and um, yeah, just really thanks to, to those individuals who've helped to gather the support and start the conversation um, and, um, and about the, really the value of our streetscapes. Thank you. Councillor Gonshevsky. Um, I was reading an actual book the other day as opposed to council meeting papers and I came across an old proverb that I think is applicable here. It's a rare occasion. Um, and it was... When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Now. And I think that, for me, I, I thought about this and I think that I'm so pleased to see um, this process, um, you know, in Mount Hawthorne. I know that this is... Um, that there has been change in our streets in Mount Hawthorne over, you know, recent years. Um, but I do think that um, this is an opportunity to implement character retention um, so that we... Um, are able to retain um, that those streetscapes um, uh, that are that clearly have um, meaning and um, you know uh, real the the community really does have attachment to their streetscapes in Mount Hawthorne. I think though that um, I still have a, a couple of things for me that I uh, I'm not sure that we've possibly gone far enough on. I mean, obviously, we're not... Um, this is character retention. We're not making any moves around development without um, DA. Um, 
we've had some correspondence and I, I also am probably um, do note that there is less in these around um, facade retention um, than there is in some of our other guidelines uh, for character and heritage um, and also around second story development. So um, given that this is something that um, the community does talk to us about regularly and we did see um, a positive response from the community in relation to our, um, our workshop and that was a great process to be part of. Um, I would, I do hope that we actually do get some commentary on this uh, when it, if it goes out for consultation. I'm supportive of it doing so um, because I would like to, to um, hear from the community to confirm what we, ha um, what has been presented um, is um, is going to um, go far enough um, and it strikes that right balance in relation to um, preserving the character in Mount Hawthorne um, and um, so I think the community voice will be um, important um, in the consideration of the um, final document but ultimately yes I'm very supportive of being at this point and um, look forward to what comes next in the character retention space. I think that there is certainly and we are well aware that there are a number of priority streetscapes um, in Vincent that um, it would be great to see community members come forward and champion character retention um, in their local area and work with the city to progress um, uh, character retention area nominations such as these. Councillors, Councillor Lowden. Uh, through the Chair, just a question. Um, I got a piece of feedback from one of the residents asking about why we did not include um, any provisions around demolition in this specific one, as a number of the other ones do. Um, I was wondering if you could provide a response to that. Three you, Meg Cole, sorry, just for clarity. Is that around the provisions that we have in... Um, sorry, we have it in Car Street, don't we? I think it was Car Street and um, Harley as well. There, there, there's it, a number of them speak to it in some way or another. In some cases they say demolition is permitted, in other cases they say it's not or it's permitted with, under certain conditions. Uh, yes, through Mayor Cole, um, for the purpose of advertising, we only included provisions that were... I suppose uh, modifying some form of what's in the R codes already. So those demolition provisions, are like, they have a bit of a different weighting compared to some of the other provisions. They're very um, suggestive or encouraging, um, whereas the other provisions that are in there uh, have, are more like requirements that must be met. So you'll see the wording is applications for development approval should maintain the front facade. There's no specific requirement unless, uh, of course, we go down that path of a heritage area. Um, could I just ask a question? Um, would there be any value in having an amendment to the motion to request that the, the city seek the um, community's views on having the character retention areas added as special control areas so that we could require there to be no demolition without a development approval? Through Mayor Cole, yes, we could definitely um, add that into the community consultation. Um, we would probably try to just get a, a bit of an idea on the intent of the landowners um, rather than suggesting an outright mechanism that we're thinking about putting on. Um, but, yeah, we, I think we were, we were planning on getting a bit of an idea around that because a few of the community members have mentioned that you know this won't exactly stop the demolition and so it seems like there is some positive sentiment around that at least so given that um demolition no demolition without a development approval doesn't actually stop demolition it just creates an additional step um is there and if council wanted that um view to be canvassed with the residents through this process would you require an amendment to the motion before us or is it administration's intent to undertake that as part of the consultation? Through you, Cole. The, I guess the policy itself is what we're actually um, requesting feedback on, so what's included in the policy. But when we present it to the community, it won't be just, here's the policy, what do you think? We'll have to tailor a number of questions around what we're proposing and we can make one of those 
around demolition, so there, there wouldn't be a need for an amendment. So do you think that would be sufficient to advise Council on the return report to Council of the outcomes of advertising to actually have an assessment of the community's views on that issue? Through my call, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, council members, Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I support this and I'm um, very pleased to see this going out for consultation as other councillors have said. There's um, been quite a process and I think one of the key elements to this, um, these uh, potential amendments is how they have been led by our community. I think it's really important that we um, acknowledge and, and um, respect that these views are coming from the community and this could potentially be a great demonstration project of how community concerns, which we're hearing a lot of around uh, both demolition and uh, new developments, can be addressed within our planning framework. So I'll be very interested to see the feedback that we get and, and keen for our community to have quite um, wide opportunities to comment on both what's proposed here and other ideas they may have so that we can land on a policy that um, that is well supported and hopefully see more of these um, projects happen around the rest of Vincent. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, just one question primarily. Um, the provisions around the straight setback, so it says ground floor primary street setbacks to be an average of the two directly adjoining properties on either side of the proposed development, should it be, should it include uh, but not less than the average of the five either side? Because I understand the idea is if you've got the average of the two, if they're further set back than the other, then the average elsewhere on the street could allow that particular property to protrude. But otherwise it seems like a far, in some circumstances, far less uh, restrictive or far less uh, streetscapey provision than what exists already in our built form policy, which is the average of the five either side. So is the intent that if there are a greater setback of the adjoining properties, that it's more respectful of that than what's going on three and four properties? Because the current provision in uh, built form policy is five either side. Through Mayor Cole, no, that's not the intent. Uh, the intent is just as it's written that it's just those two that we would take into account for the calculation. Um, it could result in that situation, as you explain. Um, but because it's applying to multiple streets, um, we felt that this would be a bit of a better way to have a... Uh, I guess it's, it's not more consistent with the entire street, but with those adjoining houses gives it more of a... It's hard to explain, but the smooth kind of transition from, say, one metre, two metre, one metre, two metre, whereas if it's all if it's, you're looking at five, then you're going to get... Um, you would get more severe differences between one house and the one immediately next door to it, which may have more of an impact on the streetscape. So presumably any property that is adjacent to a property that's on the corner, so it shares, depending on the orientation, but on the property where there is potentially a side boundary of the corner, presumably will have one of the averages at nil or very little, depending on how that property has been developed, so will potentially have its development potential brought considerably forward than what the current policy calls for. Is that, am I correct? Through Mayor Cole, no, I believe the calculation will be taken from the primary setback of the two adjoining. So in that case, one of them would be a side setback, not a primary setback. And the other one would be a, a primary setback. And because it may be unre un uh, unrelatable because it's on a different street, um, we would often just use the the local housing objective or the design principle in the case of the R codes to do that calculation. Um, and then another question, I know that, well, I'm assuming that it's been cut and pasted from uh, others, but we've got the um, peer widths maximum at 470 mil, uh, which I know was specific, I think was specific to Harley Street and the existing peers of the streetscape, but the built form policy currently has 400 mil as the maximum of peers. I know it's only 70 mil, but it's just curious as to, is that just because the provision has been carried through to other areas with, under the character retention policy? Because it's all the character retention areas are allowed wider peers than what we allow in the built form policy. Just curious as to where that's come from. It's not, it, it can be dealt with during the consultation if you don't have the answer now, but just curious as to why 470 as opposed to the built form policy, which is 400. 
Three Mac hole. No, that's correct. It's um, yeah, it's taken from the other areas. Uh, generally similar development outcomes, um, and we've already undertaken the workshops uh, with the community for those other precincts. So um, figured that as a starting point at least, uh, that would be a good base. Councillors? Um, look, I'll speak to it. I was just going back through the results of the consultation and look, I, I do um, agree that this is a really important project. It's one that I'm personally passionate about and have advocated for to try to actually have a demonstration reten character retention street in Mount Hawthorne to demonstrate to residents how it works and perhaps to take away some of the concerns or worries that residents have about character retention and what it means. But I, I, equally, I have to really address the fact that it was a little bit disappointing for me that when we actually went out to the broader precinct, um, we didn't really get much uh, attention or response. Um, some streets like Seabrook, which is a, a beautiful street of intact character homes, we've had zero um, residents respond. Coogee, we had three. Matlock, we originally had six, but then we have had a late entry. Um, and I think that one of the issues is, is that when you actually go out to the residents and say, we're now advertising something that is actually a policy and we want to sort of talk to you about what it actually says and that these are tangible things that will happen on your street. I'm hoping that this is actually the push to actually get more engagement on this issue because effectively we've reverted back to the three original um, nominations that were resident-led. We went out to a broader precinct. We really didn't have a great response. And then as a late entrant, which was fantastic to see, there was a really um, passionate resident on Matlock Street in that section of um, Britannia to Anzac who came out and somehow missed it the first time around and really just managed to get galvanise his section of the street really quickly. So it's either that you need a champion on the street who's really talking to the neighbours and door knocking and you know we had a go of door knocking out the first letter but I think equally actually having some tangible provisions on a page and saying we're advertising a policy to you with guidelines that we are thinking of introducing on your street with your feedback. I'm hoping that that actually um, actually grabs a bit of attention and that more people may um, show interest, may come to the um, information session, that maybe, um, you know, even if we just get a character retention street in, in Mount Hawthorne, I think it is literally about demonstrating what this looks like, what it means, and um, particularly where you have those really um, intact streets like Matlock, like Seabrook, um, it would be really great to see some of those residents come on board too. So. I remain hopeful and I was really buoyed by the fact that a resident came out of the blue last week and that we already have a fourth nomination which we've been ab able to add to this council resolution and I really hope that this spurs, that we actually bed those down because first of all that's not you know, necessarily done, that's, that's challenging in and of itself and that once we do that that we can actually then try to grow that and um, continue. I do go to meet with residents who are building um, off, off the peg two-storey homes with double garages and for them it's not about character, it's about location. So there is definitely different views out there and I think that we need to understand that, um, you know, that some people see this as a, as a property rights issue and it has been tried in the past and our proposal has always been about it being resident-led to actually get the passion of the people that live on the street to drive this and to set the guidelines so that they are in control of this process, knowing that people's number one asset is usually their home and it's something that is deeply personal to them. So I think it's really great to get to this point and I hope that we can build um, interest as we go through this second round of consultation on these um, guidelines. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it all those in favour. Declare it carried unanimously. The next item is 9.6, comment on draft WAPC position statement, special entertainment precincts and Department of Water and, Ener and uh, Environmental Regulation consultation paper. Moved by Council Toppelberg, seconded by Council Patakis. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Happy to support it. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, how it progresses. Um, just if I may ask a question of you, Mayor Cole, there's an amendment that's been prepared on the green, uh, which uh, I'm happy to move because you can't. Um, but just a question to you, 
No, not why. Uh, or why can't you move it? We know the answer to that. <laughs> um, but whether uh, you would consider after the words cities, towns, centres uh, to include the words and live music hubs and so where you get particularly Leederville, comma, North Perth and the potential jazz precinct, I think that we uh, would be missing an opportunity because there are known issues in and around the Rosemount. Absolutely, yes. All right, thanks for the answer. I'll let the seconder speak and then I'll move to... Thank you. Uh, seconder? Councillor Fatakis. Can I just, just one comment, just instead of pubs, just say venues, live music venues. Okay, so the second has spoken. Yes. Can I move it a minute? Yes, Mayor please Cole? do. Uh, so on the green, but with the words, so it will read, uh, and to new 2.2, the city's support for the intent of the state government's proposal to introduce special entertainment precincts and the opportunities it provides for the city's town centres and live music hubs, with an H, particularly Leederville, comma, North Perth and the potential jazz precinct. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Seconded by Councillor Fatakis. To speak to it super quickly, I think that uh, as the uh, custodians of the planning rules and the uh, health regulations that surround live music in particular, that uh, this is a move that's been a long time coming. We've seen a lot of uh, issues as the state develops and with uh, some of those uh, uh, points of angst that I think this is a, the, the, the principle of it and the way that it will assist local government but everybody to be able to uh, literally and figurative, figuratively move into these, this space with an understanding of what reasonable expectations are, particularly with long-standing existing businesses and uh, the more we can do to protect that element uh, within the city where it's appropriate, the, the happier I think we and our broader population will be. Councillor Fatakis. Um, yes, I'm supportive um, of this. I think um, it's a challenge as we um, move to accommodate more of a growing population. Um, we've got more development happening um, within our town centres and in ta entertainment venues, and many of them, like Councillor Topperberg referred to, have been in operation for a long time, many of them uh, for decades. Um, you know, I can remember going to a lot of live menu venues around Perth, um, sadly not so many um, anymore and particularly those located near residential areas are finding it increasingly difficult to, um, to comply with the NORS regulations. Um, I've spent, you know, probably since being in office has probably been one of the most common issues of concern from um, existing businesses um, trying to really um, meet the noise regulations and particularly when we're in busy precincts like um, Leadable. So I'm hoping um, that um, this will actually lead to better protection for our inter entertainment venues um, and um, offer some more sort of like clarity to the guidelines for new developments um, and give a bit of consistency as well um, between precincts. I think areas um, particularly close to my heart, areas like Leadable, that are fun and vibrant um, and I think a lot of times people are coming to these areas because they're attending entertainment venues um, and events. It's a lot of noise um, and I think we love it and I think residents also attracted to moving into these areas because of the vibrancy um, and I, I don't think they really want the beige existence of a quiet solitude that um, you know that you might get from some of our more outer, outer suburbs and I speak to that as a inner city resident and as a someone that lives in an apartment so I really understand that uh, uh, that need to gravitate towards being around people and loving the noise that that people make, and I. It, but I accept that not all residents um, feel that way. Um, but from my experience, that that's a very very small minority. Um, that, and I think my opinion, seek to crush the life out of these areas. Um, so I really look forward um, to to seeing the effect that these reforms might have. Um, there is also, too, having um, been involved in um, the Arts Advisory Group and being involved in um, the running of events even prior to being on, on council, um, the issue of um, live music and, as I referred to previously, the reduction on live 
music venues, um, venues where musicians, particularly our young and emerging um, musicians, can hone um, their craft. And I think for me, um, we often forget about um, where those young musicians can get that experience. And also, too, I'd uh, love to actually see, you know, you know, we sort of ask ourselves where the next Jebediah or Birds of Tokyo or a bit of a shout out to our formula, former councillor, Jimmy Murphy, where the next Sunshine Brothers might come from. So. I've just written down the quote of the evening, the beige existence of a quiet solitude. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Fatakis. Um, councillors, anyone wish to speak to the amendment? Um, just a comment that I put the amendment forward. Some of it was already in the response from administration, but I felt that this is a policy that does tick a lot of boxes for us and really meets our strategic strategic objective of thriving places and it really does present um, a great opportunity for us in the city of Vincent so I just wanted to raise it up and make sure that the key message going back was that we do support this um, that this uh, policy and that we see it as an opportunity for us here in Vincent particularly when you think about Leadville being our only regional centre when we're on the cusp of seeing more development happen there at the moment it's not heavy with residential development and if we could actually have something like this in place before that residential development really takes off I think that would really help establish what um, Leadable means in terms of it being an entertainment precinct hopefully in the future and residents deciding to live there are coming in there for that reason. So are there any further comments on the amendment? Okay I'll put it. All those in favour? Uh, that's adopted. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments on the substantive? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Thank you. So well, that takes us to item 10.1. Tender number 575 of 19, Banks Reserve Active Zone Construction. Uh, this is an absolute majority decision required. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved, Councillor Gontoshevsky. Seconded, Councillor Castle. Um, thank you, Mayor. I note that um, this is to accept a tender for the construction of the Banks Reserve Active Zone um, and requires some reallocation of funds um, in order to um, meet the uh, financial requirements of that process. Um, I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. I think ultimately um, the reallocation from public open space implementation to the uh, master plan um, is uh, an appropriate use of the funds. Um, I note that um, the uh, panel also looked for elements within the project that could be um, omitted to reduce the total price, um, but felt that this would compromise the overall design. So um, I'm supportive of this officer recommendation and looking forward to these works getting underway. Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, I'm also supportive of this um, proposal. Very happy to see this progressing. Uh, and uh, I note that we've worked with this contractor before with very good results at Braithwaite Park. So. Um, I look forward to seeing the results of this construction. Councillors, any further comments? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried. That leaves us with one item this evening. That is 11.6, waiver of fees, West Australian Football Commission, WAFC, AFL Women's. Um, I believe this is an absolute majority decision required. Is that why we are dealing with it? Oh because you have a question. My apologies, it's not an absolute majority decision. Go ahead, Councillor Toppelberg. You can move, yes. You got a second, great. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, so on page 550 of the agenda, the letter states, amongst other things, there are economic benefits to the Oxford Street precinct with the fixture expected to attract many patrons from outside the city of Vincent as a free community event. Uh, that's from the Executive Manager of Country Football and Facilities from the Football Commission. Uh, in the officer report, it talks on page 548 uh, about the entrance fees being significantly less or, or, and potentially free. 
uh, and in the officer's summary on page 549 it says uh, that it's uh, about female participation, it's significantly discount or free for the community to attend. Just wondering where the ambiguity came given that the letter specifically said it was going to be a free community event, why it's ambiguous and whether or not, uh, oh, that's my first question I suppose. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, we do understand it is not going to be a ticket event and it will be free to the public. There, uh, we expect that there might be some corporate hospitality um, provided by the two um, football clubs, um, and that would be a private arrangement with uh, their own corporate boxes or function centres. And whether or not that, whether money changes hands uh, wouldn't be a consideration for us as long as, uh, as the Football Commission mentions uh, that the public will be able to see and view uh, the event at no cost. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Look, I think the, um, I'll just speak to the item briefly. I think uh, the representation of uh, this as a favour to um, the people of, or well, the, the businesses of Leaderville uh, yeah, by, and uh, the, uh, the women's participation in sport, uh, at the end of the day it is uh, effectively asking a small local government uh, which has costs associated with the maintenance of its grounds and otherwise and has a, an established uh, system. It's one of not only corporate Australia but one of the largest corporate entities that is into the billions in terms of its funding from TV rights, asking little old Vincent to forego a measly $8,000, uh, which is not going to anyone's pocket. It actually, from our municipal inventory, will actually go towards things like maintaining our parks and ovals in this ground in particular. That said, uh, I think that where I landed on this that the benefit to Leaderville broadly uh, and particularly the businesses uh, and with the understanding that it will be a free community event uh, we'll be watching that because if they if it isn't the case and they come back again next year I may take a different view but I think that that benefit does outweigh it but I uh, this is presented as a community request but in fact it is one of Australia's largest corporate entities uh, holding the small local government over a barrel effectively saying we need this or we might look elsewhere and I don't think that's very fair but that's where we are but uh, hopefully the result is what we expect for uh, the community and particularly for Leaderville. Councillor Patakis. Uh, thank you Mayor. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, with regards to um, the bond, normally a $5,000 bond would be paid um, through you Mayor um, to the director, just to um, uh, get a clarity if that uh, bond would still need to, to be paid. There's a $5,000 bond um, cited on the report. Uh, through you, Merkel, I don't have uh, that information to hand, um, but as a general um, point, given uh, the proposed hire of the venue and its close association with the two waffle clubs that are a tenant. I don't expect the bond would be um, of um, uh, of a high risk to the city. Um, can I just refer you to page 549? My understanding is that they are still paying the bond. Because the bond is $5,000 and the total is $13,000 and the proposed waiver amount is $8,000 excluding bond. Yep. And also just on the um, way in which that $8,000 is distributed, um, if we were to receive it, my understanding is that a third would come to the city. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, given the arrangements we have with the two tenants, uh, the general arrangement of the lease is that we share one third the costs and uh, benefit one third of the revenue from uh, third party bookings, uh, including for the AFLW. Councillor Fatakas, do you wish to continue? Um, no, I'm, look, I'm happy to support this. I take Councillor Toppelberg's um, point. Um, it's always um, a bit of a shock when uh, such highly financial organisations um, and corporations um, really want to come to a small council and actually seek um, uh, some form of a, a discount or a complete waiver. But for me, um, the focus was on um, the women's side of the game and the support um, 
uh, you know, really focusing on supporting that aspect of it, um, and secondly, um, looking at uh, the injection um, of additional people to the Leaderville Town Centre, which we've always been focused on doing um, whenever we uh, look at uh, approving um, or uh, sponsoring uh, events in the Leaderville Town Centre. So um, the only comment that um, I would have have is that um, maybe we should look at ways that we gather that sort of information so when it uh, comes back to council and we're assessing the value of uh, such waivers in the future, uh, we might have a clearer indication about the economic worth of doing that. Councillors, any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. That was the last item that we had to deal with this evening, so I declare the meeting closed at... Sorry? Sorry, just seems to be some concern. Twelve point five was moved on block. There was some discussion, but we decided to move it on block. So we have concluded the business for this evening. Thank you. I declare the meeting closed at 7.50 p.m.